For tonight's speaker, we're going to have Merle T. Cole. And he's going to be talking about the West Virginia State Police, the first two decades. Um, he was born in Beaver in Raleigh County, graduated from Marshall in 1969, where his uh, interest in uh, state police began with a term paper from one of his professors, Dr. Paul D. Stewart. Uh, it was in a state government course in 1965. And then Merle moved beyond the Mountain State and is just returning back to us after 42 years of federal civil service. He's been in the personal management field. He's held a variety of operational and staff positions with the U.S. Army Material Command, the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers, the U.S. Environmental Protection Agency, the U.S. Air Force Systems Command, and he joined the USDA Agricultural Resource Service in Beltsville, Maryland. He was also a commissioned officer in the Maryland State Guard from 1985 to 1994, at which time he functioned as the Battalion Public Op Affairs Officer, the Great Brigade Special Staff Officer, Train Command Executive Officer, and Command Historian. He attained the grade of Lieutenant Colonel before leaving the Guard. By avocation, he is a military, naval, and police historian. He's published 70 articles and monographs and refereed state, national, and international journals. He's also created the official agency history website for the West Virginia State Police. So without further ado, and before I stumble over more of the stuff that he's done, <laughs> Merle Cole. Well, thank you, Bruno. A little over seven years from now, our gentleman Green here, I'm going to be observing the 100th anniversary of the founding of their agency. But tonight, we want to look at the first 20 years, which are, uh, which were the most formative and uh, I think in many ways the most uh, most important. Um, uh, first of all, can everyone hear me? All right. No. Am I speaking too softly? Is this thing on? You want me to bellow like a first sergeant? Would that help me? <laughs> I could do that. Can I control there? Yeah. Okay. Yes. I thought I saw some squinting eyes back there. That's why it can't be the light, so it must be. Is that good? Is that better? Yeah. Ah, great. I can hear myself now. Among other deficiencies, uh, I wear two hearing aids uh, these days, and I still can't hear everything that's said to me, which comes in handy sometimes, but can be an awkward situation like this. Okay. This thing works. This is as advertised. Ah, okay. I, uh, one good way to look at the West Virginia State Police is to look at state police in general. Uh, and there was a criminologist by the name of Bruce Smith, who, who in the 20s and 30s, came up with what he called a, a typology about how a, a state police organizations came about. Uh, and he noted that there were state police forces uh, earlier than 1900, but they were very specialized units uh, and they did not have statewide jurisdiction. Um, obviously, Texas Rangers, the uh, New Mexico Mounted Police groups like that, that were responsible for uh, border security keeping out the Mexican bandits and Indian bands and things like that. On the East Coast, you didn't have that problem, but you had, as you always do around cities, uh, a lot of vice and stuff like that. So there were, there were some specialized uh, state vice suppression units, but that's all they did. The real, the real change came, I'm sorry, I'm still mastering the technology, as they say, or it's mastering me. Here we go, okay. This is the real breakthrough in 1905 with the establishment of what was originally called the Pennsylvania State Constabulary. This was the first police agency that had uh, general statewide law enforcement authority. And it was the first state police agency where the superintendent reported directly to the governor of Pennsylvania. Uh, people um, uh, in early times paid a lot more attention to what the locals thought about things but after the Pennsylvania State Police came along, the picture changed. The, I've got it, uh, uh, the third period was uh, what we call the period of expansion, and we ended up having five state police forces that were formed within a period of eight years. Uh, the New York State Police, which was established to take care of uh, policing in rural areas, uh, the Michigan State Police, which was initially founded uh, in World War I as an internal security agency when the Michigan National Guard got 
sent overseas uh, and was made permanent after the war. I ran, I ran West Virginia State Police in 1919, and the New Jersey State Police two years later uh, were also uh, set up primarily to take care of rural law enforcement. And then 1925, Rhode Island came along, uh, and, and their, their uh, emphasis was uh, on uh, battling crime while automobiles were involved because suddenly they found the criminals could hop in in a Model D Ford and be out of a local uh, enforcer's jurisdiction very quickly and there was nobody to go after them on a statewide basis. So uh, this was the um, origin of the state police in uh, Rhode Island. Uh, one of the interesting things is that it was the New York superintendent who established the pattern of calling his state officers troopers. Okay. He did that intentionally because there were some rather nasty names that were being hurled around in the early days about the various state police forces. I will mention one of those shortly. So, uh, in, some, in some places they were called Cossacks, in some places they were called Stabs, which is short for constabulary. Uh, and some things that I want to mention because we have a mixed crowd here tonight. But, okay, the, and, and the fourth, in the fourth period, uh, again, the government wants to focus and a number of states set up highway patrols, primarily for traffic law enforcement, but then they later expanded in, in, into general state law enforcement. And uh, let us see, we, uh, we have here the, uh, the initial force was in Maine, and then there were eight more set up by 1933, so there was a big burst there in a fairly short period of time. Ah. Look at our own state. West Virginia, at the turn of the century, was a somewhat sparsely uh, populated state, and there weren't very many good roads, if you could call them roads at all. Uh, the population at the time was mostly white Anglo-Saxon Protestant, and law enforcement was in the hands of the elected sheriffs and constables. But then along comes the turn of the century, uh, the uh, coal industry starts to develop a huge influx of uh, foreign-born and black workers, uh, unionization activities took off, uh, and the ration of the operators was to hire mine guards and company police uh, and uh, a railroad detective agency, such as the famous Baldwin Phelps group out of Bluefield. So we have the first big flash is the cabinet paint creek strike in 1912-13, which I'm sure you're all familiar with. Um, it got pretty violent pretty quick. The, the National Guard was sent in the area on, on three separate occasions. Martial law was declared on three separate occasions. Uh, we had the first appearance uh, of Mother Jones as an agitator, uh, pro-Union science. And interestingly enough, in, in this period, not only was martial law proclaimed, but military courts were set up. And, and, and National Guard officers were empowered to look at all kinds of cases, not just violations of the martial law proclamation, but anything having to do from uh, a larceny, arson, adultery, uh, and, and uh, the provost marshal, the chief law enforcement officer during those periods was a gentleman by the name of Major Thomas B. Davis from Huntington. Uh, I, I marked his name on here because he'll, he'll show up a couple of more times uh, in our discussion. Um, an interesting aspect of this too, was uh, some of the uh, some of the pro-labor newspapers in the in the state uh, were causing the governor's to grief, and one of them especially was in Huntington called the Socialist and the Labor Star, uh, and on the governor's orders they were paid a midnight visit by Major Davis and uh, Second Lieutenant Grover C. Ripto and, and some other uh, National Guardsmen, uh, and, and they essentially uh, took all the types that were set up for the next day's paper and threw them in the streets. And uh, um, that led to a challenge in the state Supreme Court. And the state Supreme Court came back and said the governor was within his power to suppress a newspaper that was likely to cause further uh, disruption. Uh, of course, that wouldn't fly these days, but an interesting aspect at the time. And in 1913, the first uh, now, legislation was introduced in the state legislature to create the state constabulary. It didn't get anywhere. There's a picture of uh, Major Davis 
with uh, Mother Jones when she was uh, being held prisoner uh, in Pratt uh, in 1912. And this picture shows some of the some, some of the weapons, not all of them, that were seized by the National Guard during the strike period uh, on Kevin uh, and on Paint Creek. Uh, just looking in here, uh, I quickly picked out at least five machine guns. That tells you something. And of course, uh, the incredible amounts of uh, rifles and pistols there. But uh, five, I would guess they're 1895 type. Uh, the Colt machine gun, but I'm not an armament expert. That's on the wrong way here. Okay, another aspect of, of policing in West Virginia was um, the fact that the state had adopted prohibition statewide in 1914. Uh, they established a, a state department of prohibition to, uh, to enforce those laws, but typical of those times, the agency was understaffed and underfunded, and, and as a result, they they were not very effective, and, and there was widespread moonshining and the violence that we all associate with that type of activity. Then along comes World War I, or at that time, the Great War. Uh, this is relevant because the first thing that happened was that the National Guards of all the state were, of course, federalized uh, and taken away, so the states had no, uh, nothing to fall back on. At the time, uh, a bill was introduced into the legislature to establish a rural police department, and that also failed. But another bill that came up shortly thereafter was to establish a department of special deputy police. That's a strange sounding organization. The idea was that each county, each county court, would appoint between 10 and 100 men uh, that would have a, a state commissions, basically. Uh, and they would be available uh, for service throughout the state. Uh, it got to be very political, and such things tend to. But here our friend Major Davis shows up again. Major Davis, uh, after the National Guard was mobilized and sent overseas, was the only National Guard officer left in the state. He was the acting adjutant general, even though it was, even though it was only a major. But he was made superintendent uh, of this new department. Uh, it saw limited service. You see the, the item listed here. Um, mostly riots, but some associated with, with fires and with uh, this uh, last item on here, the Mingo Expeditionary Force, was an interesting item. Uh, apparently, a number of individuals had either uh, evaded draft or had uh, deserted from the Army and Navy, what have you, and they were hiding out in the mountains in Mingo County. So the, uh, Major Davis uh, and the Huntington Home Guard got together and decided to go on a, uh, on a hunt. I don't know how successful they were. I think they got some people, but an interesting use of the, of the organization. Now, this group only lasted, it, it was what was termed a war service organization, which meant that its legal authority only extended until the end of the war. So it went away, but uh, the very fact of its existence uh, had impressed some people that a centralized organization was needed. Here we go. Okay. So at the end of the war, we have a situation where there, there are no reliable security forces in the state. The National Guard, an interesting quirk in the law at the time, if a man was in a state military organization and they were federalized, uh, when they were discharged, they didn't go back to their guard unit. They were, they were free. They had no further military obligations. So the effect of this was to wipe out the National Guard of, of all the 48 states. Uh, and it was unfortunate because the period right after World War I was incredibly, incredibly violent all across the country. There were riots and, and mass demonstrations, problems, shooting anarchism all over the place, things like that. And between July 1918 and September of 1920, federal troops had to be sent from the various army bases to uh, uh, quell disorders across the country. At the same time, uh, West Virginia's National Guard units were not uh, reactivated until near the end of August 1921. So we had this huge hole there. People said, okay, even if we did have these Guard units, they're probably not the best force to use to take care of, of, uh, of this kind of thing. Um, a bit clunky. They're hard to get mobilized quickly. 
etc. And they tend to take sides, as most people do. Um, there was also a provision in state law that said that the county assessor, at the request of the sheriff, could draw up a list of all males who were eligible for military service, and they could be enrolled into a county militia. But that had, had obvious problems too. And, and so we left with the sheriffs and deputies who, who were usually partial to one side or another, uh, especially on the labor strike. Um, they were elective, and obviously they couldn't get too rambunctious by enforcing the law where they would alienate their, their, their constituents on one side or the other. Uh, and some of them were actually being paid for uh, uh, by coal operators, which is especially true uh, in, in the southern part of the state. On top of all this, <laughs> of course, the Russian Revolution, uh, and and the Reds won, and um, they they initiated what was called the, uh, the Red Terror, where people who were opposed to them were systematically exterminated. But there was a lengthy civil war in Russia. In 1919, uh, they established the Communist International, the Common Turn, whose function was to spread communism throughout the world. Uh, no questions about it. That was their job. Um, uh, they tried, but were unsuccessful uh, in, in several countries, uh, notably uh, Germany, Hungary, and Italy. Uh, an actual war uh, broke out between the Poles and the Soviets between 1919 and 1921. The key point here being that many people think that the, the fact that the Poles won the Battle of Warsaw stopped the Red Army from invading Western Europe. So, real problems here. In the United States, there were widespread race riots, there were strikes in, in the steel and coal industry, and even the Boston police force went on strike, and that really freaked people out. In fact, you know, you expect your cops to go on strike. Uh, and there were uh, some major anarchist bombing incidents, uh, uh, successful and otherwise. And one of the results of this, this is a, a newspaper a, a cartoon from uh, November 1919. They saw American labor as going step by step into greater and greater, excuse me, uh, periods of violence that would end in, in chaos and, and what would come next, no one knew. So there was a lot of, of, of upset and concern with, with expected backlash. Now, there was a period called the Red Scare uh, in which the, this was the first Red Scare, I should say. Uh, the Attorney General, A. Mitchell Palmer, uh, authorized the, the arrest and deportation of, uh, of, uh, of anarchist, communist, other left-leaning individuals. Some of them were even shipped back to Europe on, uh, on requ uh, requisition vessels that were called Soviet Arks. Uh, and uh, other places in the world, uh, especially in Italy and Germany, you had, uh, you had violent street battles and the seizure of power in 1922 by the fascists in Italy uh, and uh, uh, Adolf Hitler, of course, led the uh, unsuccessful putsch in, in Munich in 1923, and there were several others that are less well known. <coughs> so a lot, a lot of chaos and confusion going on all around the world. And in the midst of this, we have the governor of West Virginia, John J. Cornwell, who was uh, a conservative Democrat. He's looking around and he's saying, I gotta have something to rely on other than the sheriffs and the deputies. Okay. So he was he was a, a leading advocate in the state for the establishment of what he characterized as some sort of state police force. He wasn't really sure what he wanted. And he was joined as an advocate by uh, most state officials uh, and uh, the majority of private citizens who favored this. Most of the state press, a couple of operators and other employers, and they argued, look, if, if we had a state police force, we could do away with the private guard system, which you labor guys really hate. You know, there's some state officers out there enforcing the law rather than these, than these hired individuals. Uh, and the sheriff constable system is not working anyway. So we need something to replace it. Um, and we do something more centralized, it's going to be more responsive to the governor and not get uh, tied up with local politics. Um, roads were uh, 
with the construction of modern roads was a big deal at this time. It was called the Better Roads Movement, as a matter of fact. Uh, and if people could see, well, if we got better roads, that means we're going to have more jalopies on the road. That means you've got to have more highway patrol. So it was another need for, for something not local to enforce traffic laws. Uh, and then there, there was the, the underlying concern about the Bolsheviks and the, and the anarchists. And, and it's look what's happening in Europe right now, all the way from Russia to Italy. And there's chaos and confusion. And at, at the time, there were in West Virginia 8,000 individuals who, who, who were uh, aliens. That is, that they, were, they were citizens of subject which in the United States was still technically at war. Um, if, if you remember your American history, the United States did not sign the Treaty of Versailles that ended World War I, though we just sort of let it drag on. And, and then Congress, uh, um, on July 21st, 1921, uh, unilaterally declared the war was over and we won. So, as always, there, there, there are opponents to any major piece of, of legislation. Not surprisingly, the leading group in this was organized labor. But some state officials uh, and, and some private citizens and, and some uh, of, of the state newspapers were opposed to the uh, formation of a state police force. And their arguments were, okay, all the taxpayers are going to pay for these guys, but only the capitalists are going to benefit. Okay. Um, and that uh, one state police, uh, yeah, the state police are mainly going to be used to break strikes. Uh, they were too expensive and too small uh, uh, to get the job done as it was planned at the time. Uh, uh, local people would, would lose total control over, over any sort of law enforcement, would all be handled at a level above them. Uh, the state police would become a dangerous political machine. Uh, it was too much like having Prussians in Pennsylvania joining the state. <laughs> <laughs> at the time, Pennsylvanians were not very popular in West Virginia. Uh, it would be hard to find enough quality recruits uh, and, and, and the state tax commissioner said that the idea uh, of a central state police force was, was offensive to the state's ideals. I don't know where he got that idea, I don't know, but there it was. Uh, and one of the most telling arguments was um, a Charleston Gazette reporter by the name of Kyle McCormick, who, who later was the head of this August organization, the State Archives, uh, interviewed uh, uh, Mother Jones at the one time and said, look, all the rhetoric aside, why are you so opposed to a state police force in West Virginia? And that was her answer. Since the state police was established in Pennsylvania, we haven't won a single strike. So, very practical approach. Uh, some of the language got a little bit, a little bit lurid. Um, some people were saying that if, if this bill passes, the authority will pass from the judge's bench to the colonel's tent, and that and the the. Uh, Sorry, gentlemen, but the, the, the initial term for you guys was Governor Cornwall's Cossacks. And I know what Cossacks were in the, in the, in the days of the Russian Empire. Uh, uh, Cossacks were really an ethnic group from South Russia, uh, and they were excellent cavalrymen, and they were usually used uh, to uh, take care of, of any civil uh, disturbances uh, using large horses and broad sabers. Okay, so it was a, a sort of call, an officer of Cossack was a real insult. Like you're a, and we'll, we'll talk about it. And he said uh, that these guys would be a permanent soldiery, trained and drilled to blind mechanical response to autocratic orders, and recruited from the Cossack type of humanity, tempted by a gaudy uniform, petty authority, plenty to eat, and no mental or physical exertion. They didn't know much about law enforcement. <laughs> uh, and, and then finally, one reaction was, okay, there's no such thing as a superman. That idea has, has been done away with. You're not going to change a person's nature by giving them a nice uniform and putting them up on a horse with a gun. So all these ideas are, are, are false and won't work. And there was a great deal of opposition to the law, from, uh, I should say to the bill, uh, from various sources. But finally, it did pass. Uh, uh, the governor tried to get it through the regular session of the 1919 legislature, and that didn't work. So he called a special session thereafter, and he wanted some sort of a police bill. That's the primary reason he called a special session. Uh, a bill finally did 
uh, work its way through, passed on March 24th um, about the House of Delegates, by the Senate five days later, signed by the governor on March 31st. So that, uh, that officially should be the birthday uh, of the West Virginia State Police. And what was called the Department of Public Safety Act became effective on June 29th. My mother, by the way, was born on March 31st, about 12 years before this, and, and, and I pointed this, uh, this out to her, and I was amazed by her complete indifference. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so here's what the law called for. It would be called the Department of Public Safety, not the State Police or State Constabulary, uh, and, and, and that was a stop to organize later. There would be a superintendent who would be appointed by the governor for a four-year term. Uh, he would have a headquarters staff of a deputy superintendent, a chief clerk, and two junior clerks. That's it. It's the whole headquarters right there. Okay. Uh, the field forces, there would be two companies, uh, full platoons with the captain as commander, the lieutenant as the XO, I'm sorry, executive officer, a first sergeant, five sergeants, eight corporals, and 30 to 55 Privates, only two companies for the whole state. Okay. So the initial ceiling was 134 officers for the whole state. Interestingly enough, by the way, um, West Virginia uh, was one of the few states to, to refer to its state police field organizations as companies. Everyone else referred to them as troops. And the reason for that was that almost all of the state police forces were originally uh, uh, commanded by National Guard officers. Uh, the West Virginia National Guard at the time had never had a cavalry unit. So you didn't have any officers who, who were familiar with cavalry terminology, <coughs> squadron troops, things like that. But they were all familiar with infantry, you know, company brigade, uh, uh, the platoons and all those levels. That came along a long way. In 1998, it was state police finally finally changed their, their uh, field organization uh, from companies to troops. Some more uh, parts of the act. The individual members would be appointed by the superintendent for a two-year term uh, with a preference given to honorably discharged veterans. And of course, there were honorably discharged veterans running around all over the state uh, uh, in 1918, 1919, 1920. It probably didn't hurt that, the, uh, that the, one of the first commanders of the American Legion in the state was the guy they picked to be the superintendent. Um, the religious or political affiliation of, of an officer was irrelevant, uh, and the specifications for an officer had to be male, or 25 to 45, able to ride a horse, of sound constitution and good moral character, and able to pass the mental and physical examinations of the force. Oops. Thank you. Okay. Interestingly enough, uh, uh, unlike in other states, or, or in many other states, the state troopers were also designated as forest patrolmen, game and fish wardens, and deputy prohibition agents, in addition to being state troopers. Uh, they can exercise posse comitatus authority. Uh, in other words, they, uh, if, if a sheriff or, uh, or, or a governor uh, directed them to do so, uh, they could deputize a force of citizens to help them. Posse comitatus. Uh, they could not hire themselves out as private guards. They could not accept bribes. Or they couldn't hang around the election sites on election days. Okay. Um, and then there was, there was a strange provision that uh, said not only was uh, was the superintendent uh, uh, supposed to collect uh, data on workers and work with educations to to Americanize foreign-born inhabitants and secure a harmonious, a harmonious feeling of understanding between employers with labor and their employees. And they were going to be social workers as well as law enforcement officers. And here's your first superintendent, Jackson Arnold. Um, most people knew that he, that, well, most people found that he was a grand nephew of, of what famous American soldier? And Ken, you can't answer. I know you knew this. <laughs> he, he was a grand nephew of Stonewall Jackson. About that. 
Uh, he had been uh, a lieutenant colonel in the army, he served in France, and he, he had been the executive officer uh, of the 1st West Virginia Infantry. And here's where some of you locals might help me out here. This is a picture from uh, State Police Magazine, uh, uh, and I'll draw published by the state of New York. <laughs> but uh, it's showing State Police Headquarters at the corner of Fife and Summer Street in Charleston. Now, uh, my brief research tells me, I'm not, I don't know much about Charleston, by the way, but my brief research tells me that Fife Street was renamed Bromley Walkway or something like that. Is that right? Um, so it would be at the corner of, of Bromley Walkway and Summer Street. <laughs> but uh, the department headquarters initially was set up in the Charleston Army, but then it got moved around to Nitro. Uh, and went several other places before it ended up on the Capitol grounds in 1923. Okay, um, the field commands is the business end. Uh, Company A headquarters was established at Haywood Junction in Harrison County. The probable first commanding officer was John Esk of Huntington. Company B was first headquartered, hard word to say, you got to drive through. Uh, first headquartered. Uh, in Nitro and then moved to Canova uh, and the probable first CO was Greg Receiver up to who helped Major Davis do what we did. The newspaper in Huntington back in 1912, I'm sorry, 1913. Um, I say probable because I've not been able to establish that information as clearly as I would like to. This records aren't all that clear. Um, and by August of 1919, they had uh, recruited enough men to uh, fill one company and, and they trained them initially at a place called Pickens in Randolph County. I think it was a farm at the time. Very, excuse me. The very first man recruited was Sam Taylor. His, uh, a very brief letter from Colonel Arnold telling to report for duty. I think he said, all your clothing with you. <laughs> okay. I'll get to that in a second. Uh, uh, and Tyler uh, went on to, to become one of the, one of the earlier uh, early characters in the state police. Uh, and he retired as a lieutenant after, after a motorcycle accident. Okay, what were some of the issues they had to face? The first one, and I'm sorry for all the data crammed on this page, trying to make the point that, that uh, the recruitment and retention and excessive turnover was the major problem the state police had to deal with uh, in the first few years. And the first line is very, very important. Over 300 men entered and left the Department of Public Safety in 1919 and 1921 against an authorized field strength monitor of less than 150. Uh, in the fiscal year, personnel strength was like this. Uh, it, it went from a from a low uh, of 113 in 1921 uh, uh, to a high of, uh, of 210 in, in 1925. Average enlisted strength in 1928 was only 157, and only 11 of those were, were troopers who had originally been recruited in November of 1919. Um, in, 19, in 1926, 42% of the members were discharged, 42%, almost half. Uh, and uh, at Company B, which will figure uh, a lot in our discussion tonight, uh, was a maximum of 100 men, uh, and 35 received uh, bad conduct discharges in a 10-month period. A lot of problems. And there's another interesting uh, a demographic, um, not related to that, I hope, but. Uh, when Company B arrived in Mingo County in November of 1990, only two of the 80 men were married. And about a year later, only three of them were not married. <laughs> <laughs> uh, the, the, the commander of Company B was uh, uh, James R. Brackus. Uh, and interestingly enough, he married the daughter of the, the first sheriff of Mingo County uh, in May of 1923. At that time, he, he was 47. Uh, and the bride was 22. Okay. Uh, other uh, other challenges that Colonel Martin had to deal with uh, logistics. Remember, he told his first recruit to bring his, uh, all his clothing with him. 
because there was no money for uniforms and not much money for uniforms. And that's one reason why they wanted to hire veterans, because veterans got to take their uniforms with them when they left the service. So you ended up with a mix, guys wearing Army uniforms uh, and uh, 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 US Marine Corps uniforms. Uh, they had to bring the uniforms with them. And the shortage of horses, of course, that's a major problem because you got very few roads that can take a vehicle and not much um, money for vehicles anyway. Uh, so men who had the horses were told to bring them with them. If, if you didn't have a horse, you had to ride public transportation and to get around. Um, and, and there was not much, much time uh, or much uh, kind of stability for organized training, so that most training was on the job. Reflection of this, this is one of my favorite pictures from the from our Archives and Institute, by the way. I love the shot these three guys. Colonel Arnold said that the policing of rural communities has become a simple problem since the acquisition of horses. Well, yeah, it would be. <clears throat> kind of hard to do that on foot, I guess. <laughs> Great picture. Um, horses were, were a big deal in the state police, and this is where the horses were trained. Uh, Company A, uh, at Haywood Junction. If you look at that picture closely, from the, point, from the corner here, I'm sorry, a bunch of horses are prancing around. This is where they train the horses to be of service in the field. And here we go. Uh, right after World War I, there was what was called the First Miners March. Uh, they formed on, on Lens Creek down here at uh, uh, Marmette, about 6,000 men, uh, and, and they marched uh, through Danville, heading toward Logan County, uh, uh, and they were turned back by the governor, who, uh, who used the carrot and stick routine. Uh, you know, if uh, I'll look into your problems and add, if you don't, I'll, uh, I'll turn whatever for as I have loose on you to, to keep you in line. So they, they turned back. Um, at the same time, and the, the, there was a national um, a national coal strike going on, and a regiment of the First Army, um, uh, yes, of the First Division, uh, was sent in to enforce uh, an anti-strike injunction. Interestingly enough, uh, their intelligence unit left a list of dangerous agitators with the state police for use after they had departed, and uh, 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 that plays a, a role shortly. Mingo County, 1920. I don't want to tell you what a mess that was. Um, the UMW organizing uh, efforts, which led to the Maytown Massacre, uh, a strike call, the so called Three Days Battle during May of 1921. Uh, and Captain Brockus, the commander of Company B, um, the sheriff of Mingo County said, I want you to take over uh, and straighten things out. So he did. That was his nature. He was a, he was a take charge kind of guy, Captain Brockus. Um, he also recruited what we call volunteer state police, about 800 of them in Mingo County. A, a pretty good sized force. And then on May 19th, the governor issued a proclamation of martial law, and he appointed our old friend Major Tom Davis as the administrator uh, and, and as his personal representative uh, in the martial law district. Uh, Major Davis was a rather heavy-handed individual, uh, and, and, and he soon got to be called the Emperor of Tug River by those who did not appreciate his style. He, he did maintain order by and large. Just to give you a comparison right here uh, of, the, of the two martial law zones, the one that, uh, in uh, 1912 and 13 in the, sort of the center of the map, and then the, the 1921 uh, and 22 zone in Mingo County. The first state policeman killed in the line of duty uh, died along with a Kentucky <coughs> militia man in a firefight with some drunken strikers. Uh, the I knew there's a typo here somewhere. It's Lick Creek, not the Creed. <laughs> uh, the major a major tent colony uh, in, in Mingo County. Uh, there were several incidents of shooting there, uh, and Major Davis led a a raid there on June 14th. It got very, uh, very messy. One striker was killed, and several of the, the strikers and raiders were wounded. And almost all the males were rounded up and stuck in a jail uh, in Williamson. 
And that was June 14. And that same day, the Supreme Court, the state Supreme Court, handed down a decision that said, they told the governor, you can't have Marshall Law in Mingo County because you don't have an army. A martial law means rule by the military. And, and you don't have, there's only one soldier down there, and that's Major Davis. The state police don't count, the sheriff doesn't count, the volunteer state police don't count. So they've got to do something about it. Uh, and, uh, and the reaction was, oh, I, and, and, and the, uh, the state Supreme Court used the term that all these, all these law enforcement organizations in Mingo County were mere military cover. That's a hard thing to say. Uh, and not really soldiers, so you can't have martial law. So the governor reacted uh, by issuing a second proclamation, essentially the same as the, as the first, but he used that, that enrolled militia uh, provision that I mentioned earlier. He had the county assessor uh, uh, run through the list of eligible male voters, and they rounded up uh, a couple of companies worth and called them the West Virginia Enrolled Militia. Uh, and they were put in charge of enforcing the martial law, with Major Davis again being the, being the top guy. I have a series of pictures here that I'll probably not comment much on, uh, just, just to give you a flavor of it. This is our friend Captain Brockus. Okay. He's a serious looking man, and, and he, was a, he was a soldier. And no question about that. He was a no-nonsense guy. Um, a personal touch there. He, he died in, in, in Huntington in November of 1966. And I was going to Marshall at the time. Had I known, I would have interviewed this guy. <laughs> the great opportunity to miss. So don't ever put things off. Okay. Here's a, and here are, are the big, the, the big four law enforcers in Mingo County. All right. Okay. Uh, Captain Brock is there. With uh, right next to him is Judge R. D. Bailey, uh, the sheriff of Mingo County, uh, Alonzo Penson and Major Davis on the far right. <laughs> in more ways than one. Okay. Um, one of my favorite pictures of New York This is Company B, standing on the courthouse steps, the old courthouse uh, in uh, Emigo uh, County. Uh, Catherine Brock is, is, is front and center in the, in the first row. Uh, let me see how to do this. There's a fellow, all these people have numbers on their, on their heads, you see? Excuse me one minute. This guy here, number 38, just we're looking for the camera. That's, uh, that's Private uh, uh, Pettery, and, and, and Private Pettery became famous because he married uh, Sid Hatfield's widow. <laughs> Remember that story, the Mayton Massacre, the mayor, the mayor was killed. The mayor's wife married Sid Hatfield, mm -hmm. and then, as we'll learn here shortly, uh, Sid was killed in August of 1921, and then she married this guy. <laughs> I think that lasted four or five years. But interesting sideline. Okay, um, here's Sergeant Sam Taylor. They're standing tall, uh, and a trooper guarding a coal train. Uh, a couple more troopers. Captain Brockus uh, here is uh, uh, riding the horse in the lower corner. He was uh, he brought his horse with him from the army. He was quite a uh, uh, an equestrian, and he would he would do tricks with his horse to entertain the citizens of all things. And uh, the stance that's shown here, he could he could make the horse stand up on his hind legs for up to 15 seconds at a time with him sitting in the saddle. He, he once quipped that the horse has a slight strain of vanity and always perform better with an audience. <laughs> okay. Uh, the upper picture of the, these shows the things were not always hard times in Mingo County. Uh, the first Sergeant Peterson there with uh, Private Cackley um, on the right. He was the, he, he was the second state trooper who was killed in Mingo County during the strike. 
Uh, the bottom picture shows uh, an officer who's escorting a couple of prisoners in Williamson. Uh, it was off in the Lick Creek grade, and this officer with his horse was wounded was, uh, on private bowls. And, and the bottom line outcome of the raid is, is all these individuals lined up here waiting to get into the, into the slammer in Williamson. Um, Fourth of July, 1921, of course the state police in Mingo were, 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 were formed up to uh, take part in the uh, uh, Veterans Day parade. But they called Veterans Day, then it was called uh, Remembrance Day, I believe it was. Anyway, here they are at the, at, at the NW station, and here's some uh, homegrown prohibition. Um, people dumping innocent booze down the gutter. And you see some state police uh, individuals there, as well as a bunch of uh, citizens. This is a this is the picture from which that early one of the big four inch engine was taken. And they're right toward the front. This is some of the stills the company B collected <coughs> in, in moonshining rates in Mingo <coughs> County during 1922. Some of them. This picture was from a uh, I think it was the Charleston Gazette in uh, December of 1922, or, or thereabouts. But there were, there were more serious things than moonshining, including the Battle of Lair Mountain. I mentioned earlier about, uh, about Sid Hatfield uh, having been killed uh, on August 1st, along with his deputy, uh, Ed Chambers. Uh, that prompted the so-called Second Miners' March, Again, from Lens Creek up through Danville, wherever. Um, the, uh, the march had, had sort of, depending on who you, who you listen to, the march had sort of petered out. But then um, our friend Captain Brockus led a, led a raid across, uh, Logan, uh, across from Logan to Beach Creek uh, and, and got into a nasty firefight with some striking miners. Uh, and um, that was immediately called the Sharpman's Massacre. Although it wasn't masculine, it was just an exchange uh, of the, the firefight. But that got the march going again uh, and led to, uh, to the fighting between the, uh, the, the uh, striking miners and the, uh, I call them the forces of order, uh, defending the, the line in Logan County. It was deputies, and state police, and volunteers from mm -hmm. most of the southern West Virginia uh, uh, counties. Uh, Colonel William E. Eubank of the National Guard was put in charge. Uh, Colonel Arnold of the state police was there with, with 120 state troopers, uh, mainly a Company B, uh, a Captain Rex Rick, with a newly activated uh, a Company D under a, a man who his name will show up a little later, uh, Harvey Rex Rick. Okay, uh, I've got some pictures here. The gallery, they call it. There's, there's from a Eubank. The next series of pictures uh, are from the Batman archives. Uh, and it, I don't think too many of you have probably seen them before. And they, they're all from the, from the uh, 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 defending forces during the, during the Blair Mountain Battle. Just, I'm sorry. The guys on the bottom are marching alongside a railroad track. Here's a bunch of Logan County deputies. Uh, the guys on the bottom, uh, the, a mix of uh, civilian uh, volunteers uh, and state police receiving their rations. If you read um, Lon Savage's book, I think it was in there, or maybe it was in Golden Seal, I forget what it was right now, but one of them said that what they mainly got to eat was uh, 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 bologna sandwiches and soda pop. And that was a combat ration. Didn't have any MREs back then. <laughs> uh, this is one of the classic pictures from that time. Um, a group of, of uh, uh, deputies, and uh, on the far uh, far left there is uh, a state trooper manning another one of those 1895 machine guns. I think you probably have one in the state archives up there. I mean, in your archives and institute of memory service. I think I saw one there several years ago. The picture it's about half the same. These these are actually uh, a couple of. Um, uh, state troopers who are exchanging shots uh, of the strikers uh, on Spruce Fork, Blair Mountain. This whole business came to an end, of course, when uh, 
uh, General Bandel, so the, the U.S. Army came down uh, and said, if you don't knock it off, we're going to proclaim martial law. I'm simplifying the which great one. Knock it off, we're going to proclaim martial law and bring the U.S. Army in here and, and kick some time on both sides of the line. So uh, he, he, he actually ended up having uh, three regiments of infantry sent in uh, and uh, um, separated parties. Uh, this is a picture of Van Holtz and, and some of the troops arriving in Logan, Logan City, I should say. Uh, these are the first four officers of the state police who were killed in line of duty. And all of them were associated with either Mingo County or the Battle of Blair Mountain. While all this was going on, the legislature finally concluded that the uh, that it was a good idea to have a state police force. So they passed a law in April of 1921 that doubled the state police field strength. They went from two companies to four, okay, uh, with a new ceiling of 286 officers uh, statewide uh, and two additional clerks. Uh, it's interesting to look at the initial distribution of where the company headquarters were. Company A was in Hayward Junction, where it had been, which is up around Clarksburg. Company B was in Williamson, C was in Clothier, uh, um, C was in Beckley, and D was in Clothier. Did, does that suggest anything? Anybody knows where those towns are? They're right in the middle of the, what was then the, the smokeless non-union fields. Another aspect of it, oh, here's an example of it too. That this is the initial complement uh, of Company B, which was commanded by uh, 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 Lieutenant Mack only, who's another one of the uh, uh, stars, if you will, of the early, early force. Uh, and as is how the companies, the company areas were, uh, were chopped up uh, in 1927. At that time, Company A had moved to Shenston. Uh, B was still in Williamson, C was still in Beckley, and D had moved to Parkersburg. In addition to the state police, in addition to the state police, where'd that come from? That's not one of my official ones. <laughs> uh, the National Guard, of, I, I'm sure they finally got reorganized. Uh, and, and, and one newsman said, the state is authorized, is authorized to have 15 companies of National Guard. Fourteen of the companies are being concentrated in or near the non-union coal fields, and only one is in a position to not be of immediate service in protecting the non-union territory. And, and three quarters of the state, the northern um, and eastern counties, uh, are going without any international guard units uh, or whatever. The interesting thing is that the 15th company, the one that wasn't down with the coal fields, was in Grafton and was a military police company. <laughs> okay. Our, our narrative now changes from southern West Virginia to the north. And during this period, there, there was, uh, oh, I should say, first of all, that the, that the, that the Mingo County strike finally ended in October 1922. Uh, the UMWA had essentially spent itself into to dire poverty and, uh, uh, and they called off the strike. And then the strike, strike violence in the state shifted to the northern coal fields. Um, there, there was more um, violence against properties and bombing of tipples and, and things like that rather than uh, uh, shootouts with uh, officers, etc. cetera. Um, uh, Marion Berber and I'm sorry, Barber and um, uh, Montegilio counties especially. There's an, there an interesting incident uh, in July 1922 when some strikers from Pennsylvania crossed the border into West Virginia uh, uh, and attacked a mine in Cliftonville. And I think in that incident they also uh, uh, killed the county sheriff. Um, but generally speaking, most of the violence uh, in the coal fields ended with, of course, the, the uh, stock market crash in the Great Depression in 1929. It's been called the last major conflict uh, in the West Virginia coal fields or up north. Here's a 
a quick gallery of the 1920s, the second superintendent of the state police, uh, Robert O'Connor. Uh, he, he was he was a lawyer in Elkins. He had also served in France. He was a major in the Coast Guard Charlie Corps, so, uh, an interesting branch to be in. Um, Tony Gosho. Uh, Tony Gosho uh, was an interesting character because he and his brother, one of West Virginia brothers who were both awarded the Medal of Honor, in totally different circumstances. Uh, uh, and there was so, uh, uh, well, they were both in the Army, of course, and the Medal of Honor uh, being a state trooper. But Gosho had been a mine guard. He had been a National Guard officer and, and a commanding officer of Company B of the State Police at Clothier. Uh, another one of the leading State Police officers was Thomas Norton, who he commanded all the companies uh, and ended up being in charge uh, uh, of Company, um, company C uh, in Beckley. Uh, and he died there of a heart attack in 1931. He's an interesting character. Captain Lloyd Lehman, uh, not only was he a state policeman, but in, in 1931 he was offered the post of fire chief of Parkersburg. Uh, and he took the job, and he went on to become a world-renowned authority and how to fight structural fires. Quite a change. He, he also, um, he was the fire chief in Parkersburg from 19... Uh, 31 through 51, but with a short break during World War II, to serve uh, as the director of a firefighting training for the Coast Guard. Um, our, our old friend Major Davis, by the way, there's a time had this kind of strange. Major Davis was, was the chief of the Huntington Fire Department from 1911 to 1919. Okay. Uh, a detachment of Elkins. I'm going to flip through this quickly here. Obviously, the horses were the, were the backbone of operations off the paved roads, of which there were still very few in the, in the, in the 1920s. This is an, an interesting sign here. I don't know if you can make out what it says. It says West Virginia Mounted State Police. Now, of course, that wasn't the official, official title, but it was very descriptive. I love that picture. Classic 1920s photo. Uh, this individual is, is, is a, a lieutenant who recently became, um, who later became uh, a company commander, Captain Reinhardt. Here you go. Uh, if we're dealing with serious matters, this is a, uh, a detachment at, at Sharon, and, and these guys are carrying, if you look from the left, a Browning automatic rifle. Uh, in front of these two guys in the center, it, it, it's a heavy machine gun, uh, and, and the, fellow, um, the fellow on the right is holding a Thompson set of machine guns, so these guys were loaded for bear. Yeah. Not just 38s. <laughs> Here's a, uh, there's some more moonshine stills. <laughs> uh, and uh, uh, this time, Club the Year. The club here in Boone County, I forget. Thank you. Right on the border that way. Hand to hand combat training, jiu jitsu instruction back in the 20s. I had no idea this kind of thing was going on that far back, but there they are. <laughs> it wouldn't be complete without a tracker dog. So here's, here's the obligatory tracker dog. <laughs> Houses, at least one bloodhound, I don't know what the others are, but good looking bunch of dogs anyway. Remember, I told you that the, that the, uh, the troopers were also a forest patrol and they were fighting a fire in the eastern panhandle. I can't tell much of their equipment though, they're sticks. <laughs> now, the fact that that's going to be uh, a pistol competition team. Give some idea of what, of what these guys were doing at the time. From 1919 to 1930, you can see the data here. Um, the, the total arrests went from 3,549 in, in the uh, biennium 1919-1920 up to 
up to uh, 28174 uh, in 26 through 28, and then it dropped off slightly. Um, and not surprisingly, most of the arrests were, were for uh, uh, misdemeanors. A busy period. The word frugal, of course, mean, mean, means to save. So here was a frugal meter that saved me. Okay. Um, it, something you would never hear of at any level of government these days. <clears throat> the first two superintendents, Arnold and O'Connor, never asked for additional funding for their department. Uh, and in fact, they, they returned money to the state treasury every year through 1928. <laughs> As someone who worked for the federal government for 40 years, uh, this ain't going to happen in these folks, I tell you. <laughs> Then they returned money to the state treasury. Uh, and then after 1920, you got into the typical situation where, like every agency, had their fighting to keep their appropriations, et cetera. But interesting piece of data. So we moved into, out of the 1920s, into the 30s, which are characterized by organizational turbulence and a, a surprising amount of technical leadership. However, first we've got to get over a problem here. This was the next superintendent, Harry L. Brooks. Brooks was the first superintendent who was appointed who did not have any military experience. In fact, he was a, uh, a career politician. He was the chief of police in Clarksburg and in Britain. Uh, uh, and his tenure caused some problems. We'll talk about that in a minute. He was replaced by Robert Osborne, who was a Clarksburg city manager, a Spanish-American war veteran. Uh, he was a commanding officer of the 1st West Virginia Infantry. He had been Colonel Arnold's boss when they were in the National Guard together. And he'd also served in France. I guess I gotta get moving here. Colonel Osborne. Uh, Colonel Shingleton, President E. Shingleton. This is an interesting situation. He was an insurance agent, but he'd been, he'd been a sergeant in the Army and had served in France. He was also the adjutant general of West Virginia. Um, from 1933 to 35. In other words, the same time he was head of the state police, he was the head of the National Guard. I don't think I've ever heard that happening anywhere else before. And here's a, a man I mentioned earlier, uh, Harvey Rexroad. Harvey Rexroad was acting superintendent between the time uh, Shingleton left uh, uh, and his replacement came on board. Um, he had spent a lifetime, almost a lifetime, in the veteran army, in the infantry and cavalry. He served in France as a captain. He was on the first group of, of, of men to enlist in the state police. He was the first man commissioned um, as an officer, uh, as a lieutenant, uh, after entering as a private. Uh, and he was appointed uh, to a job called captain inspector, which was, in effect, the deputy superintendent uh, in, in 1933. It, interesting quote here. He is generally quite credited with doing more than any other one man to build up the force to its present high place of efficiency and respectability. <laughs> well, I think uh, most of his contribution would have been at the headquarters level. And trying to organize things. And, and, uh, yeah, although, although he was a film, he commanded a couple of companies. Well, I'm, I'm asking a question. How do you put together that the first eight years they had this tremendous turnover? Yeah. They were under equipped, and the superintendents were returning money to the state budget. Is that a conflict there somewhere? Well, if they look at the when he was the, the, the uh, captain inspector starting in 1935, so. I think that that's the period where he started having his most influence. Uh, prior to that time, he, he was in the film Fighting Fires prior to that time. I'm uh, not going to be fighting fires, you know what I mean? <laughs> the first eight years that were mismanaged was their superintendent. He's what? I'm saying the first eight years of state police that were mismanaged was their superintendent. I don't know if mismanagement or, um, hang on a second, I'll tell you about mismanagement in just a second. Okay. <laughs> Are we ready? Okay, thank you. Thank you. Uh, I would imagine this guy retired. Uh, Captain Rexford uh, uh, retired in October of 1946 uh, and then became Charleston police chief for a couple of years. And here's probably 
this is the last superintendent during our period here, Charles Tallman. He was the head coach of the WVU football team. Mm -hmm. he, he, he had no military or police experience. He did have a law degree. He had been in the state legislature. He was a farmer of my profession. But his uh, head football coach. Okay. A scandal in the chief books. I thought this guy books was a problem. Uh, um, in 1931, th the composition of the legislature changed dramatically, uh, and the Democrats took over. And one of the first things they did was establish a committee to look at allegations that Brooks, who was a Republican, uh, had committed a range uh, of improper or illegal actions. Uh, charges were filed against Brooks and other top officers in the department uh, uh, before the uh, DPS Board of Commissioners, which was uh, a civilian body that investigated charges against state police officers. Uh, Brooks said this is all politics, uh, but he resigned uh, on June 10, 1934. Uh, this is some of the things that, that the investigation uncovered. Um, first of all, they looked at companies B and D which, uh, which were headed by our old friend Captain Brockus and Captain Raymond uh, by this time. They didn't have time uh, to look at companies A and D. Uh, and they said, uh, these two companies have, to a large extent, degenerated into uh, political machines or institutions rather for the protection of vice and crime than agencies for their suppression. And here's what they, they trotted out. First of all, they said there's a whole series uh, of personnel actions that appear to be based on politics, whether Republican or Democrat. Um, they, there were charges that many of the personnel actions were made, were made to, to please Hatfield Republican uh, faction in Logan County, uh, that Republicans had been favored over Democrats uh, in promotions and reassignments, uh, that Chief Brooks had promoted his son from trooper to sergeant and, uh, and to uh, lieutenant in charge of the detachment in Logan. Okay. Um, in 1930, uh, September 1930, uh, that same Lieutenant Brooks ran a so-called state police camp uh, on Hart's Creek in Logan County uh, that became notorious for drinking and rowdiness, and he was forced to resign. Remember, this was at the height of Prohibition, <laughs> 1930. Okay. Uh, uh, Chief Brooks w was charged with leaking information on planned plan anti-moonshining raids, something that she didn't do to have to, to, to uh, uh, Captain Brockus. <laughs> yeah. um, he was charged with blocking enforcement of anti-slot machine laws. Uh, uh, he, he supposedly falsely accused Captain Brockus of accepting bribes from moonshiners. Um, he, appeared, he appeared along with several senior officers of the state police in uniform at a June 1930 uh, social function at the Hatfield home in Logan County where liquor was served. And, uh, and, uh, and they all partook uh, mildly, <coughs> so the reporting went. Uh, he ignored off, uh, efforts by the Logan County uh, political machine to blow up a Moon County Moon County, a Boone County newspaper that was critical of them. Um, he, had, he appointed <clears throat> courtesy DPS members and supplied them with uniforms and badges. Uh, and that was bad because um, at the time the DPS was authorized uh, uh, free public transportation uh, and these people could purchase gasoline for their uh, private automobiles uh, on department credit. And then last but not least, he used uh, State Road Commission funds to illegally increase the salaries of, of several officials in headquarters. There's a whole litany of problems there. And uh, some of probably was politics, but if there was enough, there was enough fire there that he decided to leave town and, uh, and did resign. So you see that there was some major problems. <laughs> <laughs> okay. <coughs> Contraction. This is where the organization of turbulence comes in. The appropriations uh, cut 
and in, in 1932, uh, 35 men had to be laid off. And then additional cuts in July 1933 forced the four companies to be combined into two. Okay. So you end up back with two companies again. Uh, several personnel were uh, reduced in grade, for example. Uh, two of the captains became lieutenants. Several lieutenants became sergeants, etc. cetera. Um, but nobody had to be laid off that time. Uh, and, and closing some of the detachments saved the barracks run up. They were able to save enough money that they could conduct a major uh, recruit training camp at the National Guard's Camp Donnelly in 1935. Here's a picture of the individuals undergoing training. And here you go. When the, depart okay, uh, the department announced it was it needed to recruit 80 members, 80 members, and they got over 4,000 applications. 4,000 applications. At, uh, it was where they cut it down to, to uh, a reasonable number. A hundred trainees managed to complete the course, and 75 were appointed that, and the other, the other 25 were put on the reserve list. They could be called up uh, you know, for future employment. And, and then, in 1935, appropriations eased up a bit, uh, and Company C, was reactivated at this time at Alkins. And then in 1936, finally, uh, the total recovery from Company D was reactivated in Bethany. The state police retained that, that four company field structure uh, until 1954 when, uh, when the de facto fifth company to uh, enforce laws on the turnpike. It was called the Turnpike Division initially. Was set up, and then in 1998, the companies were uh, redesignated as troops, uh, and there are currently seven troops uh, in the field structure. So we went from a having to a, to an expansion uh, and, and a slight increase in the period. Okay, the the major missions during the 1930s, the, there was um, the Logan City Police Chief. His name was Roy Knotts was going to issue arrest warrants for slot machine operators. He walked into a pool room, and the man walked up to him and shot him in the head. Uh, that kind of upset some people, especially since the Nazi had formed, had formed the Benin State uh, uh, Trooper himself. Um, the governor sent uh, a 25-man uh, detachment into, um, into Logan to guard the state attorney general, who was assigned as a special prosecutor in the case. The trial ended in February with the accused man being convicted and sentenced to 18 years in the state pen. Uh, and, and then the governor told the state police to close down all the slot machine operations throughout Logan County. Uh, in the northern, uh, and the northern counties, there were some labor disputes in 1931 uh, through 33, uh, Clarksburg, Fairmont especially. Um, in, in 1933, during during a strike at Weirton Steel, um, there was a 40-man uh, task force uh, under Captain Brockus, uh, and they used tear gas. I think for the first time uh, in state police history. Um, and the Ohio River flooded uh, two years in a row, uh, 36 and 37, which is why you have all those flood ones along along the river now. But uh, state police were called in to. Uh, uh, prevent looting and uh, assist the uh, uh, relief workers. And finally, uh, prohibition was repealed in December of 1933, but the high tax on liquor meant that 60% of liquor consumed in the state was still due late, late as 1935. After that, the alcohol-related arrest tapered off. Highway patrols uh, and increasingly uh, a significant mission during this time, and one of the first dangers you ran into is it was motorcycles, which caused one third uh, of state police death uh, during 1919 1939, the, the time we're looking at, uh, uh, second only to gunshots. And the Charleston Gazette reported on one day that an officer was killed in Parkersburg uh, and another one seriously injured in, in Charleston when their motorcycles. Uh, uh, I collided with automobiles. 
um, the very first EPS recruit, uh, uh, Lieutenant Sam Taylor, uh, in retirement and disability after losing a leg in a motorcycle accident. Uh, finally, the superintendent said enough, uh, and he really cut back on, uh, on the use of motorcycles, so there were only 26 in the inventory in 1936 versus 100 cars. Here's some quick images of the, uh, in this case, motorcycle highway patrol, the side cars. Whoops. Uh, highway, uh, highway patrol by an automobile and motorcycle. And the other notable thing during the second decade was technological progress in the state police. They established a driver license examining uh, function in 1931, the Criminal Identification Bureau, 1933, a teletypewriter net, uh, uh, and intelligence bulletin called the uh, uh, Police Exchange, which went to over 500 uh, police agencies in West Virginia and nearby states. The Highway Safety Bureau, the nation's first mobile first aid unit, uh, and a radio net, which was uh, Begun in 1939. This is a, a classic 1930s car here on top. And then the bottom car is the West Virginia State Police Safety Car in the year 1937. It says here that there were 503 people killed by automobiles in 1936. 503. Okay. Another aspect of technological progress, well, uh, I mentioned the radios, the, the initial radio center for the state police was in the basement of the Capitol building. I can personally remember walking in down there and looking around, maybe wave at you. No, no, no concept of security like we have today at all. It's right in the basement of the Capitol building. And then uh, Charles W. Ray, some of you guys I'm sure have heard of, he was, he was the first commander of, of the Criminal Identification Bureau uh, and later was probably the most instrumental person in establishing the State Police Academy of Institute. Um, here's your evidence of high praise. In 1936, FBI Director J. Edgar Hoover named the West Virginia State Police one of the nation's leading law enforcement agencies. And as they say in, as they say in Latin, say fini, that's it. <laughs> Okay. Uh, a few questions, and we got to get everybody out of here before they lock us in. Do you have any questions? Uh, I do prefer the one I want to approach, so all questions must be submitted in writing. No, I'm sorry. Go ahead. <laughs> when did horses get fake? I'm sorry. When did the horses disappear? Oh, gee, I don't know. I suspect you guys probably still have some mounts around somewhere, but uh, I would imagine probably in the early 40s, maybe. I'm, I'm guessing. I have no idea. Right? But, uh, at that time, the automobiles were so, were so common. You know, and the roads were always parallel in the most parts of the state. I'm not sure that's true today. But mm -hmm. good. Just, I'm sorry, I can't give a direct answer. I just don't know. Others? I was curious if the uh, if the police I'll come to you. <laughs> okay if the police uh, if the police themselves uh, how they saw their own position during the Blair Mountain battles you know I mean did they see themselves on the side of the coal operators in your opinion were they more or less there to block the labor okay uh, question you have a question as I understand it is. How did the state police see themselves at the time of the environment? Uh-huh. I don't the term, by the way. Uh, I saw a story where a newspaper editor uh, in, in 1870 uh, in New York referred to the Civil War as the recent unpleasantness. <laughs> okay. um, state police were definitely there on the side of law order to block the advance of the striking mines. No question about that. They were there in the orders, and that was their function along with Logan County deputies and volunteers from all over the state, from the south. Um, 
Very, very, very well. There been some sympathy in there for sympathy and have a mission, but the sympathy aside and do your job. Right? That's the way it goes. On Does that answer your question? Yes. And interestingly enough, the only state trooper who was killed that day or not was actually killed the day before the firing started. It was part of the jewel. I've had three separate accounts. One, uh, the official report says that he was accidentally shot by another one of the defendants, you know, in barracks, I think the town's Ethel, that's where they were holding up at the time. Another report says that, that he shot himself while he was cleaning his weapon. And the third report, which is uh, unfortunately, uh, if you go to the National Law Enforcement Officers uh, Memorial, it tells you he was killed during the process of the arrest, and that's not true at all. So, but, uh, and that was, I think, uh, like, uh, the day before the fighting actually started. So, all the others were killed in the end of the time. Okay. Right. You're afraid to ask in public. <laughs> <laughs>